The struggle is real. I don't know if you face this in your life. You probably have at some point, but the struggle is real. And uh, that video, I believe, portrays accurately why Satan devises for us as Christians. He wants us this way. He also wants us to return. Turn with me to Romans, the ninth chapter. We ended up last week at the 13th verse, but I told you we'd talk about it a little bit because it sets up today's message. So we'll start, it's not on the board there, but we'll start in Romans 9, verse 13. And it says, As it was written, it continues to be written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. That brings up some interesting questions. You, you realize that Esau and Jacob were the twins. And one was actually born before the other. You know, you don't come out simultaneously. One is actually older, technically, than the other. And Esau was technically the firstborn. And he had the right to the birth. His, that was his birthright. He would have gotten his father's blessing. But God chose Jacob instead. Don't get too misconstrued about him saying, I loved Jacob, but Esau I hated. Don't get too involved in that because he's not really talking about hate and love because they hadn't even been born yet. You know, he, he'd already chosen Jacob. He preferred one over the other, even though Esau was born first, going against him in all tradition. Today, when we look at this passage, it's going to sound a little familiar to us. The refrain of, why did God let this happen? How could a loving God and a just and merciful God let this happen to me. I've heard it over and over and over, and people want some kind of elaborate explanation for why God allowed something to happen, or sometimes they'll say He did something to them. Well, we're going to put that in perspective today, and this is the answer to that question. And I, I will, can I tell you something? Don't ever use God's words in <clears throat> mysterious ways. It means nothing to no one. Now, what I mean by that is, to a non-believer, even to a believer, those words are hollow. But this is an answer that we have here today. And Paul was addressing this because it was a question during that day. So let's look at first, let's look at verses 14 through 18. And let's see what Paul starts out with. Remember, he had just talked about Esau and, and Jacob. What then will we be saying? Will we be saying, lest unrighteousness is with God? God forbid. For to Moses he is saying, I will have mercy on whom I might have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I might have compassion. So then, not of the one who is willing, nor of the one who is striving, but of God who is having mercy. For the scripture is saying to Pharaoh that for this purpose I raised you up in order that I might show for myself in you the power of me and in order that my name might be proclaimed in all the land. So then, who is he desiring? He is having mercy and who he is desiring? He is he is having mercy and who he is desiring, he is hardening. Paul's question here is pretty shocking. Is there unrighteousness with God? Remember what it was that caused this question. God went against all the laws of men in the ancient world, the laws governing the inheritance of the children. 
According to man's law, the oldest son was to receive the inheritance. However, in dealing with Isaac's children, God announced that his oldest son, Esau, would serve the younger son, Jacob. Jacob was God's choice to inherit the promise made to Abraham and Isaac. And I want you to notice something. God chose Jacob even before the children were born. It had nothing to do with whether or not, you know, whether or not Jacob was a, you know, had done good things and uh, Esau had done bad things. God had just chose. So the question is this. Can God elect men? Can He favor or dis and favor dis favor and disfavor men? and still be righteous and just. I know some good people who seem to have the worst luck. Everything seems to have gone wrong in their lives. And I know some people who are not so good people who seems to skate through life. And it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem that God is being just. Can I tell you something? If God chooses to show mercy to men, He has the right to do so. Even when men do not deserve it. Again, if God show, chooses to show compassion to men, He has the right to do so even when men do not deserve it. Pharaoh, on the other hand, was a, was a very sinful. He was an evil man. <clears throat> God demonstrated His justice in Pharaoh. God acted righteously towards Pharaoh. So just as men execute justice upon evil men, God executed justice upon Pharaoh because he was evil. God is God, therefore. He has the right to execute justice as he wills. He's God. A man needs to seek the face of God. For mercy. You say, but well, I'm a good person. And all this is happening to me. No, you're not a good person. Sorry. You're a sinner, just like me. There is none good. No, not one. We are all, we just got to make different degrees in, uh, in, according to men, but according to God, it just takes one for us to be ungodly and not good. So, what he does is we ask for his what? Mercy. And he gives it. A man needs to seek the face of God for mercy and needs to guard diligently against becoming hardened like Pharaoh to God. We could spend the rest of the morning talking about why God hardened his heart and how that happened. But let me just put it like this. God used Pharaoh to accomplish something of His will to show the world and Israel who He was. So in verses 19 through 21, we continue that He has the right to do as He wills. You will say then to me, why then is He yet finding fault? For who has resisted and continues to resist His will? Oh man, on the contrary, you who are replying to God, the image will not say to you, say to the one who formed it, why did you make me thus? Or is the potter not having power over the clay? Indeed, from the, of the same lump to make the one vessel into honor and to another into dishonor. You will say to me, why then is he yet finding fault? For who has resisted continues to resist his will. Paul here is imagining someone asking, well, if it's all a matter of God's choice, then how can God find fault to me? Well, God, you made me this way. Look, if it's all a matter of God's choice, how can you find fault? Because you made me. How can anyone go against God's choice? And he says, on the contrary, 
Paul replies by showing how disrespectful such a question is. If God says He chooses, and if God also says that we are responsible for Him, then who are we to question God? Does not the potter have power over the clay? You ever wonder when you looked in the mirror and asked, God, why did you make me look like this? <laughs> I mean, I think we've all done that at some point. God, why did you make me look like this? Why couldn't you make me look something different? Well, he's the man, he's the potter. <clears throat> and does not God have the same right that any creator has over his creation? He can do what he wants. As he wants. And we have a guarantee that he's righteous and he's just and he's merciful and that he loves us. And we have to trust our creator when we find things about us that we don't like. Or things that happen to us. Do you realize that He's not through with molding and making you now? He is forming you as we speak. <coughs> Every day that you live, He is forming you and making you. And sometimes He has to go, oh, that spot's not right. And He crushes that spot, remakes it, and reforms it. Now that's not always good when it comes to what happens to us in our lives, is it? Sometimes we have to take a few steps back. Sometimes we have to have some setbacks. Sometimes God has to put, <clears throat> apply the pressure in order to form us into what He ultimately he wants. you got to understand, God is not through with us yet. He's molding us. He's making us. So if God declares <clears throat> that we have some eternal responsibility before Him, then it is so. I've often wondered myself, I said, I would often say, Lord, why did you call me into the ministry? All things. I don't know. All I know is that he decided, he decided that he wanted to use me in that way. So he has the right to do as he wills. Have you ever questioned God? about whys, therefores? Have you ever been asked, well, why did God let this happen? Why did this do, you know, why is this person getting away with this? And, 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 you know, and, the, and it goes on. I, I, and the answer is simple. It's because He's God. And He has the right to do as He wills. It's very difficult when you have babies who die. And, and, and you're trying to comfort them. They have not lived a long life at all. But you may tell you something. God sees it from a different perspective. God sees it from a perspective of five, uh, five months, 15 years, 50 years, 80, 90 years. Compared to eternity, is nothing. It is appointed unto men all, once all to die. It's all going to happen whether you're young or old. That's the perspective he has. It is his right to do what he wants with his creation. In verses 22 through 24, <clears throat> verse 22, he says, And if God, after willing to demonstrate the wrath for himself and to make known his power, endured vessels of wrath with much long suffering, why being thoroughly prepared and continues to be prepared for destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory to vessels of mercy, which he made ready in advance for glory, even us, whom he called not only out of Jews, but even out of Gentiles. The subject, the real subject here, Why are you showing mercy to those heathens? We're the, we're the children of God. If God, and again the same principle from 
God's dealing with Pharaoh is repeated. If God chooses to glorify Himself through letting people go their own way and then uh, letting them righteously receive His wrath so as to make known His power, who can oppose Him? You have a choice. He allows us to have the choice of living righteously or unrighteously. To living godly or living ungodly. <clears throat> and He uses your choice in the best way He sees fit. I don't know the mind of God. I don't know the will of God when something happens in your life. I can't tell you what God is, has in mind. I can tell you one thing. As I look back in my life, there was one particular incident in my life where we lost someone that we loved before I went into the ministry. Hey, God used that. Some went righteous and some went unrighteous because of that one incident, but God used it. And He uses things like that. And you wonder, all right, for those who are who go the unrighteous route, those who do the bad things over and over again, they seemingly get away with it. And God doesn't curse them. Or, well, God's going to use their unrighteousness for His benefit at some point. And besides, do you think they're really going to get away with it? Because it is appointed for men unto, uh, for once to die. But then what? Then the judgment. He didn't say he was going to pronounce judgment before they died. He pronounces judgment after. He might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. So as well, if God desires to be more fair with others, showing them, showing them His mercy, who can oppose Him? It's like that you get, you're, you're going down the road and you're, you're with a person in another car, and you're both going 15 miles over the speed limit, and the trooper comes, and he pulls both of you over at the same time. It happens, trust me. You're not being part of it, you've seen it. And, and so he goes to one part, the one car and he writes them a ticket. Then he goes to the other car and he decides to give mercy to the other car. If, you got, if you're the one getting the ticket, what are you going to be saying? That's not fair. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'd be saying it too. And in that way, we, we gauge how God chooses people to be merciful. I know that in, in other places, if they were to, if they were to have a recovery ministry like we have, uh, they would be saying we don't need to spend all that time and effort and money on those kind of folks. They just don't deserve it. Now we don't do that here, obviously, but there are places that you'll you'll encounter people with that kind of mentality. That they don't deserve God's mercy because of the way they've lived their life. And here I've been all my life serving faithfully and I don't get that kind of attention. Kind of reminds you of the prodigal son. Doesn't it? Well, the older son was like, what's the deal? I've been here the entire time. And you're making this big... You see the point? If God desires to be more fair with others, showing more mercy with others, who can, who can say God is wrong? But also the Gentiles. And if God wants to show mercy to the Gentiles as well as the Jews, who can oppose it? That's Paul's point. They were complaining. Because Paul was taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul says he's willing to show mercy to all. So God, they believed that God, the Jews did, could not make them anything but vessels of honor. They were God's children. 
They, they, there were promises made to them and God was going to bless them no matter what they did. Paul rejects this view and points out that God does what He wills. He says, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Paul does not say that God has prepared them for destruction. These vessels do an adequate job doing that on their own. So in verses 25 through 29, And also in Hosea, also in Hosea is saying, I will call those not my people, my people. And those who were not loved, they continue not to be not loved, ones who were loved and continue to be loved. And it will be in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called the sons of the living God. And Isaiah is crying out concerning Israel. If the number of the sons of Israel may be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will remain. For the Lord will accomplish the word while from on the earth finishing and cutting short. And just as Isaiah had said, except the Lord of armies did leave behind to us offspring. We have become as Sodom and we have been made like the Lord. Start with, you are not my people. These are passages from Hosea 2, 2.23 and 1.10. And they show the mercy of God. You know, God told Hosea to name one of his children, Lo am I, Lo am I, Lo am I. Meaning, you know what that means? Not my people. <laughs> he named his child. He was told to name his child, Not my people. Yet God also promised that this judgment would not last forever. <clears throat> and that one day Israel will be restored and once again be called the sons of the living God. The remnant will be saved. And yes, the seeds of Abraham, he was promised that the seed of Abraham, the seed of Abraham will be as the, as the sands of the sea, innumerable, and that happened. He didn't say all of them were going to be saved. He didn't say all of them were going to be restored. Just a remnant. And this passage is quoted from Isaiah 10, 23, and it speaks to God's work in a saving remnant from the coming of Assyrian destruction. The suffering of God's people at the hands of the Assyrians and others would make them feel as if they would certainly be destroyed. And God assures them that that's not the case. He will always preserve his remnant. Always. It, God's promise, remember how we started the chapter? God's promise is not failed. There will be that remnant will be restored one day. You know, God has always dealt with the remnant. It's, it was stupid to think that since the whole nation had not entered into the blessing that the promise of God had failed. The promise had been made had not been made to the whole nation and had never been intended to apply to the whole nation. You know who it was intended to be applied to? Those who trusted and followed God. And those who trusted and, and had faith and believed in His Son when He came. That we would, he said, God gave you. He's talking to Jews here. God gave you mercy. Well, that's terrible. I mean, after the Babylonian Empire came, the Assyrian Empire came, and destroyed everything. They were, you know, they had no home in me. This is what he says. We would have become like Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah were completely destroyed in judgment. And the quotation here is from Isaiah uh, 1 9. It shows that as bad as Judah's state was because of their sin, it could have been worse. It was only by the mercy of God that they survived it all. Sodom and Gomorrah were both completely destroyed and not even a very small remnant to carry on. But God in His mercy looked at sinful Israel, those who turned His back on Him, and said, 
I'm going to be a remnant. I'm going to keep my promise despite what you've done to me. Even in the midst of judgment, God showed his mercy to Judah. And the merciful promise is clear that if only a remnant will survive, at least a remnant will survive and constitute the hope of restoration. Why, why, why does God allow things to happen to us? These bad things. I go to church. I live a good life. I, I do the right things. I don't break the law. I, and, and it just seems like everything in the world is going against me. I, I eat right. <laughs> My health is bad. God, oh God, why? Paul asked that one time. You, you remember when he said he had a thorn? God has got to give him a form. God asked why. He asked him to remove it, but God said, what did he say? No. My grace is sufficient for thee. Oh, I wish we could have that kind of faith and trust. God does as he wills. I just have to trust that everything he does is going to be all right. And you know what? It really doesn't matter what happens to me in this life. Because of one incident so many years ago, one thing, one encounter with God, 48, 48 years ago, wow. Because of that night, that when I said, Lord, here I am, save me. I allow it. I've been saved for 48 years. And all the th things that's happened to me good, all the things that's happened to me bad, all the things that are currently happening to me right now, <clears throat> in the end, all lead to the same place. And that's at the feet of Jesus one day when I pass from this life. And every decision that I make in this life on my own without God, God's going, no, 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 no. I got this plan for you. But you just don't know. Because we're not God. We are the creator. We are the creation. He's the creator. And we need to allow Him to complete His work in us. We need to also remember that life is not fair. Well, I take that back. It is fair. It is fair. It's just that some get it, you know, get their just dues early and some later. We're all going to go to the same place. We're going to go to the grave. And the problem is this. And the only question that really matters is this. Are you prepared for that day? Are you prepared for the day that you pass from this life when you take your last breath? If you are, and you're prepared, and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, and you know where you're going to go when you die, do you, you, you know something? You can live this life without all the burdens that we typically live. Oh, we need to be concerned about things and take care of business and do those things, but ultimately... When the things happen that makes us go, why? We can turn to God and say, all right, Lord, let's see what's happening next. Let's see what you've got in store for my life. But if you're not prepared, if you're not prepared, it doesn't matter how bad you've been, all the terrible things that you've done in life, no matter how you rejected and turned away from God at every point in your life. Today, I believe with all my heart and all my soul that He's talking to your heart right now saying, Come, I'm going to be merciful to you. You don't deserve it. But He wants to give you that kind of mercy and grace. And give you an invitation to come to Him and ask Him.
Lord, we just say, let me be. Let you be the center of my life. And all you have to do is say yes. Tell him yes. Trust and believe in him and then turn your life over to him. And let him mold you and make you. So as we stand this morning, we prepare for an invitation. I don't know your heart. I don't know your life. I don't know your relationship with God. But let me tell you, you need to, you need to examine it. You need to make sure, first of, first off, that you have made that decision and God has come into your heart and saved you. You need to know that. And if you know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, you need to start trusting God with your life because He is the one that is in the process of molding and making you. But if you're here today, or within the sound of my voice, and today you realize that you never made that commitment to Jesus Christ. You never received His mercy. You don't know what it's like to live without the burden of knowing that one day you'll die and you'll not know where you're going to go. You can find that out today by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, life, save you, change you, and He can begin to mold you into what He wants you to be. So as we sing this morning, if the Lord's dealing with your heart, would you come and make it right with Him in whatever way?